Alrighty, hello bosses, and welcome to our latest Fierce Fall webinar. I'm Emily Aries, Boss Steps founder and CEO, and it is my pleasure to welcome everyone today to add to your boss toolkit. Now, your boss toolkit is our weekly webinar series that helps you gain the skills we all need to craft happy, healthy, and sustainable careers. And this fits into the broader Fierce Fall Challenge, which I know so many of you have joined online with us for these next 10 weeks to achieve our biggest remaining goals of 2015 before Thanksgiving. It's such a pleasure to welcome in Alexandra Anweiler Stevens, who's joining us from Boston today to share with us how to expand your network on LinkedIn. Now, I want to encourage us all to tweet along at boss.org and tweet to Alexandra at AA underscore Stevens. And be sure to use that fierce fall hashtag that we're all using to hold each other accountable throughout this challenge. And if you haven't signed up already, it's not too late to join us. It's totally free. It's packed full of resources. And you can get all the details at the link you see on your screen here, bossstep.org slash fierce fall. I want to start off by welcoming in so many incredible boot camp alums and fierce fall participants who are joining us from all over the country and ask that you weigh in right now. Start our chat bar off strong by sharing with us some of your fierce fall goals. So what is it that you are striving towards? Because Alexandra and I and the whole community of bosses online today can start to cater this conversation around helping you leverage LinkedIn to achieve whatever it is that you're striving towards. And just as a heads up to give you a sense of what's coming down the pike, next up this very weekend here in Washington, DC, we're hosting our next Bossed Up Boot Camp, our flagship weekend long program for women navigating career transition. If that sounds like you. You have until midnight tonight to apply to join us this weekend or at our next one coming up in December. So you can head to the website, bossstuff.org slash bootcamp to check that out and learn more. Coming up next week, we are so, so excited to sit down for a power lunch series with Gloria Felt, a legendary feminist icon, total rock star who will be tuning in from New York City. And then the week after that, our next Boss Toolkit webinar, like this one, is all about using social media to land your dream job. Now, Alexandra is joining us now from Boston. She's the Associate Director of Career, I'm sorry, Alumni Relations and Career Advancement at Brandeis University. She's a dear friend of mine and was one of our original featured trainers at Boston Up Boot Camp back in the day when we were up in the Northeast. So Alexandra, if you want to turn on your camera and take us away, we are so excited to welcome you here today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Emily, and welcome everyone. I'm so happy. Ooh, Alex, we can't actually hear you right now. Hmm. Can you, let's try that again. Can you hear me okay? Not yet either. Uh, so folks, thanks. Oh, you can hear her. All right, it must just be my problem. So Janelle okay. says that you can hear her just fine. So ignore me. <laughs> That's happening on my end. Ladies, there is nothing more fun than a live webinar. Let me just tell you that. So I'm going to disappear. Take it away, Alexandra, and I will figure my end out. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Emily. Thanks for the warm and, and energetic welcome. Thanks so much for spending um, your lunch hour with me for those of you who are tuning in at work. Um, today, we are going to talk about how to expand your network on LinkedIn. Um, and I am so excited to be speaking to the Bossed Up community. Having done a boot camp um, a couple years ago, um, I think this is a really great way to expand your toolkit um, and learn a little bit more in depth about some programs that uh, that you might not know about. And so we're gonna go over some tips and tricks today um, that's really going to help you utilize LinkedIn to its fullest. So to tell you a little bit about me, like Emily mentioned, I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Career Programs and Engagement, very long title, here at Brandeis University. So what that means is that I help alumni uh, find meaningful careers and also help them to connect with students. And so a lot of my job is about networking, personal branding, et cetera. What's interesting about my career path is that I started in marketing and communications. That was what I majored in. I worked at uh, Constant Contact, an email service provider, which many of you may know, um, before coming here to Brandeis. And so my career path really fuses together 
branding on the company side with personal branding. And that's why I'm so passionate about networking and especially about LinkedIn. So here's my contact information. Feel free to tweet me, send me a message on LinkedIn, um, and uh, away we go. So what we're going to be covering today is some LinkedIn profile quick tips. Now, uh, the branding piece of our discussion, that's not the bulk of it. We're going to be talking about how to expand your network, but I would be remiss if I did not go over some of my tips that have worked well, not only with Brandeis alumni, but with some private clients that I also meet with. We're gonna talk about the power of groups and how you can harness that. We're also going to talk about how you can do research on companies right in LinkedIn. Then we're gonna do some uh, tutorial about job search. And then especially finding people. And then, so once you find a person that you want to contact, um, contact, what do you do? And so we're going to talk about the best practices for that outreach through the LinkedIn platform. So getting started, you're all here most likely because you think LinkedIn is a worthwhile tool. So you probably have a profile because you think you should, but maybe that's all you've done with it. Now I'm here to say if you choose one social media tool to commit to for your job search, it should be LinkedIn, and here's why. So as you can see on your screen, it's the world's largest professional network with over 380 million members, spanning 200 countries and territories around the globe. And so opportunities really abound to find connections, jobs, um, and other resources, uh, no matter where your interests lie. It's also important from a branding perspective because having a LinkedIn profile helps you control your Google search results. So if someone's searching for you online and they type your name into Google, what do you want to appear first? Um, typically LinkedIn profiles appear very close to the top of LinkedIn search results. So it's really nice to be able to utilize a LinkedIn profile to control how you're appearing and what is the first thing that people see about you when they Google your online presence. Another important thing to know, and the percentage is why, uh, very widely, um, but anywhere from 70 to 94% of recruiters and hiring managers are on LinkedIn. They're using it to both source and vet candidates. So um, this is where hiring is happening. Social media is a huge research tool for companies to find and vet out the best and worst candidates. Uh, so you wanna be found here and you wanna be found in your best light. And then the other piece you may not know is that there's been over 3 million jobs posted to LinkedIn. And so, you know, this is a new platform where companies are turning, maybe sometimes um, in lieu of posting on their own company websites to really target their positions to the people that they want. So um, we're going to talk about the many ways you can use LinkedIn uh, to build your professional brand, stay connected and expand your network, research companies, careers, fields, and people, and search for jobs. The focus of our talk today, though, like I mentioned, will be on expanding your network. So I want to know first a little bit about you. So like Emily was mentioning, I know a lot of you have created fierce fall goals. So I want to know how expanding your network on LinkedIn will help you achieve that goal. So I'm going to go into the first of four poll questions that we'll be launching. And so um, if Emily, you could launch our first poll for us and all of you take a moment to weigh in, which best describes why you want to expand your network on LinkedIn. So if you could take a moment to weigh in now, is it to build your personal or professional brand? Is it to expand your client or customer base if you have your own company? Is it to reconnect with professionals you already know? Um, is it to meet professionals who you can who can help you with your career? Or is it another reason? And if it's another, then um, you can add that to the chat box and Emily can let me know um, what you all are saying. So I'm gonna give you a few more minutes to, a few more seconds rather, to weigh in. And then we're gonna stop the voting process. So it looks like from what we're seeing here, um, the majority of you, vast majority, 60% of you are interested in meeting professionals who can help you with your career. And uh, about 20% of you are looking to build your personal and professional brand. So that is excellent. Thanks so much for weighing in. 
And we'll come back to another poll question a little later on in the presentation. So now that we've identified the why, we need to identify who you wanna connect with. So on LinkedIn, um, as in the job search, many people say it's all about who you know, it's all about networking. And that's why it's so important here to expand your network on LinkedIn. So first degree connections, those people that you're directly connected with on LinkedIn, represent only a small portion of the total opportunity your network holds. Your direct connections have professional networks of their own, meaning that your second degree connections and third degree connections are exponentially larger than your current professional network. So that's why it's so important to um, start with the low hanging fruit. And by that, I mean first starting with social connections, your friends and family. I don't want you to, dis to discount your cousin or your mom or your brother or even your husband um, because you never know who they're going to know. Same thing with friends. We want to think about academic connections, uh, former classmates, fellow alumni from your alma mater, professors that you've taken courses with, staff members at a university you attended and that you had a connection with. And then professional connections of people you already know, coworkers at your current job, past coworkers, supervisors, folks who you attended a conference with and had a really great experience with, um, other members of an association or a professional group you may belong to. So again, that's kind of the low hanging fruit, the people you already know that you could already be connecting with. And then there are those future connections. And that's what we're really going to be talking about today. That could be potential networking contacts, potential informational interviewees, clients, um, people that are going to help you in your career and people that are going to um, potentially hire you in the future. So that's the who's on LinkedIn. So now that we know who else is on LinkedIn, I want to go over quickly what others will see when they search for you. So what are they going to find when they search for you on LinkedIn or they Google um, your name? So um, Emily, if we could launch our second poll, and do be honest here, even if it's embarrassing, when was the last time you updated your profile? Was it today? Brownie points. Within the past week, within the past month, within the past year, or has it been longer than a year? And we'll give you a couple more seconds to weigh in and then discuss the results. So it's looking like about a third of you have updated within the past week, other third within the past year with a smattering everywhere else. All right, so I'm feeling like this is an honest group. I like this. Um, so there's really no sweet spot for how often you wanna update your profile, um, but there are key moments in your professional career when you might wanna do so. For example, if you get a new job, if you start attending a new graduate school, if you've received a new degree or certification, you've gotten a promotion or received an award. Um, other times, updates um, might not be to your profile itself, but it might be sharing an update with your network um, through like the discussion feed as in other that other social media uh, tools use as well. So you could notify your network about an upcoming conference that you'll be attending or about a LinkedIn webinar that you may be giving. So again, no sweet spot for how often you should be updating it, but it should be up to date with your current professional experience, certifications, and job titles. So I wanted to go over just quickly, and Emily, forgive me for just snagging how you appear in search results here. Um, I wanted to go over some quick tips. Again, this isn't gonna be the focus of our presentation today, but I'd be remiss if I didn't go over them. So like I mentioned, the first is really to keep your profile up to date. You wanna be searchable and you wanna be appearing in the correct searches. So when you appear in a search, you can look at Emily's example on your screen right here. What appears is her name, her headline, which is Crafting Sustainable Careers with Bossed Up Women in Workplaces, her location, which is DC, and um, the industry that she's assigned to herself, which is Civic and Social Organization. Um, it's important to double check 
your location and industry. Are these up to date to reflect your current career, your current living situation? Um, do you instead want them to um, reflect your aspirational career goals. So this is something that people often forget and it's one of the first things that they see when they search for you. So um, just a reminder to at the end of this webinar go on to your own profile and see how those are listed. Um, another piece is to um, before you get started with making any edits to your profile be strategic about notifications. So in your preferences section, you're able to turn on or off, you'll see it right here, the notify your network button. And this is a really strategic decision. If you're making major edits to your profile, you're playing around with your experience section, you're writing a new summary, you're changing your photo and seeing which one works, be sure to change it to no, so that your, note, so that your network doesn't get Alexandra just updated her profile. Alexandra just added a new picture. Um, it will bombard their news feed with these updates. However, if you just got an award and you want to let your note, um, network know about that, it's a really great opportunity to turn that back on, add the award to your award section, and then they'll just get that one update and hopefully congratulate you. So just wanted to throw that out there about notifications. A lot of people start making changes and then their, um, the notifications on their network just goes a little berserk. So next I wanna just talk about the must have sections, run through them really quickly. The first is, and these may be you know, uh, elementary for some folks here, you have to have an appropriate photo. Some people might say this is optional. I say it is a must. Um, it helps to remind people who you are. Um, for example, if you did meet someone at a conference, it's much stronger to have a name and a face than just a name. Um, and it needs to be appropriate for your industry and look like you today. So we don't want someone else's shoulder being cut off in the side. We don't want it to be something from five years ago or be with you with bangs if you no longer have bangs. Um, but it needs to be appropriate for your industry. So I've worked with clients. I worked with someone who has a raw milk uh, cheese farm. And, um, and so her photo is of her and her and her husband, who's the co-owner, and a, and a wheel of cheese. And you know what, that works for her. Um, but a CIO at a technology company um, shouldn't necessarily be dressed in uh, casual clothes. He should be looking like a C-level executive that he is. So you really want it to reflect you and be appropriate for your industry. Um, the next thing is the headline. It needs to be attention grabbing. So many people um, use just the default headline, which happens to be your current or most recent job title. So it would be Associate Director of Alumni Career Programs and Engagement at the Higher Career Center at Brandeis University. Um, sure. That's fine, um, but one thing that someone said to me in another presentation which really resonated was, your title does not define you. It doesn't define you. It's not all of who you are professionally. And so use this headline piece, this real estate, this very important real estate because it's one of the first things that appears in search results to customize it and let them know who you are as a professional. And if we have time later, if folks wanna ask about particular headlines, we can go over that. Um, the next piece is a professional summary. Uh, so LinkedIn profiles can get very long. It's not like a resume that has to be one or two pages. Um, we have unlimited real estate on LinkedIn. And so sometimes instead of scrolling all the way down, what I do when I look at folks' profiles is I'll jump right to their summary to get a, to get a snapshot of who they are professionally. Um, this is also important if your career path is not linear. Oftentimes our career paths aren't linear. Um, and so it's really important to have this summary section that ties it all together, explains who you are, why you're on LinkedIn, who you wanna connect with, connect with. Next is a keyword rich skills section. Again, um, those search results, recruiters could be searching for you um, and you wanna make sure that you have the keywords that would show up on a job description, such as skills that you have, um, particular technology skills, webinar skills, whatever it is, make sure that they're listed on there. And then like we talked about, an updated experience and education section. Um, it's only going to open up your network further if you have both your undergraduate school on there and your graduate school on there. You'll be opened up to all of these alumni. So 
that's all that we're going to really have time for today for profile quick tips. If we have more time at the end, feel free to ask questions about it. And I do have some resources here. The first is from LinkedIn itself, a LinkedIn profile checklist, which again goes over some of these basics. And then also an article um, that a colleague of mine had written about how freelancers should create LinkedIn profiles. Again, there's going to be different things for different industries. And for those of you who are freelancing or do contract work, it's a really great read. So we talked about the importance of being searchable on LinkedIn, whether it's clients searching for you, professional connections, recruiters. Um, as it turns out, people who participate regularly in group discussions on LinkedIn get more profile views, go figure. And groups also greatly expand your network. So I want to know, Emily, if you could launch poll number three, which best describes how you typically interact with groups on LinkedIn? And many of these may apply to you, but what is your typical? So have you joined any groups yet? Um, do you just join them and you're kind of more of a watcher? Um, have you posted and responded to group discussions being more of kind of an active participant? Um, have you posted and or searched for jobs within a group? Or are you a group moderator? Um, and we'll give you just a couple more seconds and then launch into it a little bit more. So it looks like the majority of you, 78%, 79% now, have joined groups, um, but it looks like you haven't done much more. So that's good. So maybe some of this coming up will be something you haven't heard before, which is great. So I want to talk to you about the power of groups. So as, as noted in uh, the last poll, there are really lots of different levels of engagement with groups and there's no right or wrong. It's just what you're comfortable with. So first off, why groups? What can you do in a group? Um, one of the things is you can request and share professional expertise. You can post and search for jobs. You can and you can get access to new contacts. So there are groups um, for any variety of things on LinkedIn, typically with a professional slant. Um, for example, your alma mater may have an alumni networking group, which I highly suggest you join. Uh, professional associations, uh, past employers. Uh, for example, I used to work at Constant Contact, as I mentioned, and there's a group for past Constant Contact employees to stay connected and stay chatting with each other. Um, and then interest groups. So for example, I'm also part of a marketers who make a difference uh, group on LinkedIn, which is um, brings together mission-driven marketers all in one place. Um, so not only can groups do all of these things here, but they also help round out your profile. So from that branding perspective, just seeing the types of groups you list in your profile can help paint a better picture of you as a professional, what your interests are and what your interests are. Uh, some groups, as, as you may have seen as you're requesting to join them, are closed and you need to be accepted by a moderator in order to join them, whereas others are open. And actually you'll find many, many are open groups and so they're easier than ever to join. One of the best things in groups is that you can send messages to fellow group members. Now this is based on their preferences, so maybe not everyone is going to allow you to send a message to them, but the vast majority of fellow group members in a group will, um, will allow you to message them. And why is this important? So if you can see on your screen here, I just took a screenshot of my uh, alumni LinkedIn group from Northeastern, um, and you'll see there's a members tab, and there's also, it also lists the number of members in that group. So if you click on either one of those, um, it'll bring you to the full members list, which is searchable by keyword, by the way. And then you'll see the list of fellow members, and I use my uh, supervisor here, Andrea, as an example. Um, what will appear below their name is a send message button. This is so important. Um, the way I describe it, uh, sending a message versus an invitation to connect. The invitation to connect is like asking someone to marry you before you even have a first date. Okay, the message is more that first date. Um, and so anytime you can send a message versus inviting them to connect, it's so much better. Couple reasons, the invitation to connect is truncated. It's a really short message. You don't have a lot of words um, at your fingertips to be able to customize it. Whereas the message can be far longer. Um, you can customize it, you can add your own 
um, subject line to it and really um, tailor it to whoever you are contacting. So that is the power of groups. If you remember one thing from this presentation, remember that you can message fellow members and um, I'll reiterate that again at the end as well. So in addition to groups, many people often forget about company pages. So according to the poll, many of you want to expand your network because you want to meet professionals who um, can help you in your career, whether that's getting a new job, exploring a new field or industry. And company pages on LinkedIn give you a lot of information. So I've included one of my favorite companies here, Boston-based company TripAdvisor, um, to, to highlight this as an example. So if you look at um, the tiny TripAdvisor uh, screenshot here, you'll able to, you're able to see how you're connected. So for example, if I wanted to work at TripAdvisor, I could see who I know currently that works there, um, who people I know know who work there, and other connections. And you can see all employees in one place. You can also see current job postings. So like I said before, over 3 million jobs are posted on LinkedIn and that number is only continuing to grow. So um, a lot of companies have targeted some of their recruiting efforts to LinkedIn and now post jobs here um, in addition to or in lieu of their own company websites. Um, you can also follow them for news and updates. So if you're going in for an interview with a company or an informational interview or just want to learn more, um, similar to checking out their Twitter page, checking out their company website and checking out Facebook, um, they also post recent updates on their company page on LinkedIn. And then lastly, um, exploring similar companies. So there is a people also viewed section on TripAdvisor, on TripAdvisor in particular, but um, on most company pages um, that lists company competitors or um, companies that are like this company. So we see here Kayak, Airbnb, Expedia. This is really useful for career exploration. So say you're interested in TripAdvisor, but they're not currently hiring what other companies might be of interest to you. Um, and so again, a wealth of information on company pages and it's all right there. You can look at the, um, see how you're connected, view the job postings, see similar companies and get news and updates that are gonna make you feel prepared for your next interaction with an employee of that company. Next thing I want to go over just quickly, again, I keep reiterating 3 million plus jobs. It's a lot of jobs. Um, you can, and it's very searchable on LinkedIn. So some of us may be familiar with Idealist or Monster, um, Indeed.com. Um, searching for jobs on LinkedIn is very easy. You can search by title, keyword, company name, industry, zip code, job function. And you can find this advanced search for jobs under the jobs tab on your LinkedIn dashboard advanced search. Now, like I mentioned, jobs are also posted in groups and they are also um, posted to the company pages themselves. So um, another thing to mention, you can't see it in the screenshot here, but this is also the same page where you can customize the specs for the jobs you might be interested in. So you may get emails from time to time from LinkedIn saying, you might be interested in marketing jobs in Boston. Um, and you can actually adjust those specifications so that those emails coming to you are as targeted as possible using some of this um, qualifying criteria here. So that is jobs. If you're searching for a job, LinkedIn is definitely one of the places to start. Now I'm going to show you two easy ways to search for people, um, whether you know them or not. And like I mentioned to you, I work at Brandeis University doing alumni engagement. So um, it's not surprising that I would start with the LinkedIn alumni dashboard tool. Uh, but before I launch into how you can use this and where you can find it, I want to let you know why you would want to search for contacts. So maybe you want to find who are your connections to a job or a company of interest to you. Maybe you are doing research on the hiring managers or other people who are going to be interviewing you. Maybe you want to search profiles of people who have the skills and career trajectories um, 
and who are doing your dream job, looking for those model people um, that you can help build your career after. Um, or maybe you're recruiting new clients or new hires for your company and you want to target your outreach and be really specific. Um, so these are the reasons why you might want to find people. And the first tool to, to start um, for many of those is the LinkedIn um, alumni dashboard. So you can find this at linkedin.com slash alumni or you can go under your connections tab and go to find alumni and you can customize your school. The default that will come up is your most recent school. So I studied abroad. My most recent one was a, a school in Spain, but then you can adjust it. You see right here the blue change university button um, to whichever school is your preference. And um, the reason I always start with alumni is you have something built in in common. You went to the same school. And I found in my job, and I can uh, very easily attest, that many alumni are happy to hear from fellow alumni or students for that matter. Um, but you have to tailor your outreach. And so I can't tell you, we, you know, we do get calls from time to time or emails from alumni that said, I got this horrible LinkedIn message from a student. They did not customize this at all. Um, what are you teaching them? And um, then we send them to our LinkedIn page where we teach them all the right things and we say we can only do so much. But alumni are happy to hear from you. You do already have something in common. And this dashboard is so easy to use and it's so uh, visual. So you can see right on your screen, you can narrow it down by class year what they studied, if you wanted to find other people in your major and see what they're doing now, um, what they're skilled at. This is coming from that skills section. So if you wanted to see um, folks whose job requires Microsoft Excel, how you're connected. If you wanted to look only at group members, for example, because you remember from this, participate, from this presentation that you can message them, you can sort, sort by that as well. Where they live. So say you are moving to the San Francisco Bay Area and you, want, and you need a roommate. This could be a really great way to see who from your school is living in San Fran. Um, you can narrow it down by where they work. Um, for school administrators like us, it's really interesting to see how many of our alumni are at certain companies that could help us target companies who might want to recruit students. But you, for example, you could be interested in a job at Fidelity, Fidelity here and oh my god, 514 Northeastern alumni are working at Fidelity. Um, and then what they do is their industry type. So if you wanted to see alumni working in healthcare services, you could narrow it down that way. Um, the results appear just below in a very visual way with the person's photo, their class year, and their job title and location. Um, so really easy way to sort down um, and see results rather quickly. And um, again, starting with alumni is a great place. Then once you find them, see if you have a group in common. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. The next tool is the advanced people search. So you can click on that in the search bar at the top of your LinkedIn um, dashboard. It'll say advanced and you can conduct it there. And so you see here, you can search for people on any number of terms and certainly moving outside your alumni base. So if you wanted to, um, again, on LinkedIn, there's lots of different ways to do things. So if you wanted to see which employees work at TripAdvisor in the Boston office, you could go to the TripAdvisor company page, or you could go to the advanced people search, type in company TripAdvisor, location, you'd set it to a Boston zip code, and then hit search. If you wanted to see what alumni from your school work at TripAdvisor, your school, you'd put in Northeastern University, company TripAdvisor, and location. Um, so lots of different ways to modify your search here, depending on what you're looking for. Um, and again, you can sort down by location, industry, um, relationship, if you, if you want to see group members, for example, and drill down that way. So, um, I'll, I'm happy to take any questions at the end as well um, if people have folks on how they can find folks on LinkedIn. But now I do want to go into our fourth and final poll of the afternoon um, before we launch into our best practices for outreach now that you know how to find all these people. I want to first ask a little embarrassing question. Have you ever received a LinkedIn message or request to connect from a stranger? 
someone you don't know, you look at their profile, you look at their name and you're like, eh, I don't know who they are. Did I meet them at some point? I don't know. Um, and they put that in that you in that kind of funky, awkward position. Like, am I the one not remembering? Okay, I'll give you a couple more seconds if anyone else wants to weigh in. So not surprising results here, folks. Um, a hundred percent of us have received a message or a request to connect from a stranger. Um, doesn't feel good. Um, and so I want to go over some best practices for outreach so that you aren't um, putting others in this very awkward position. So I have a few do's and don'ts. Um, and the first is do be selective. So it's a two way street, like we just mentioned. You feel weird getting things from strangers, they're gonna feel weird too. So be selective about who you're reaching out to. A lot of people um, will use the um, people I may know tool on LinkedIn and then auto invite hundreds of people that are their contacts. Um, and this is not good. You really wanna be tailoring um, tailoring your out, outreach and being selective about who you're bringing into your network because your network reflects who you are as well if you're connected to them on linkedin people assume that you know them that you could vouch for them professionally so the next do is send a message obviously so if you you know you found who you want to connect you know why you want to connect with them um, see if you have a group in common it's the best way um, the second best way, if you don't have a group in common, you can't message them, ask to be introduced. So you'll see on your screen here a little screenshot of one of our students, Brandon. Um, when you go to someone's profile, always click on their full profile before requesting to connect with them. Because what happens sometimes if we're looking at them in search results and just hit connect, sometimes it automatically sends them that automated message. And that is a big no, no. So in order to make sure that you can personalize any message that you send them, always go to their full profile page um, before hitting any connect buttons. So first best case scenario, send them a message. Second best case, ask to be introduced. So you'll see a little small drop down arrow to the right of the connect button and the in-mail button. And you can see right under personalized invitation, it says get introduced. This is if you have a um, first connection who happens to know this second connection, you can customize that, that um, request for an introduction. So for example, Emily, I noticed you were connected to Jason. He is working at a company that is of interest to me um, and I'm thinking about a career change into social media management. Do you think you could set up, um, you could facilitate an introduction for us to, to just chat about his career path? So again, you're using someone you know who's already in your network, who's willing to vouch for you professionally to someone that they know, shows how exponentially your network can grow. Always write your introduction request knowing that most likely someone is go they're going to just forward your request to that individual. So don't be too casual, even if it's someone you know well, um, make sure it's professional and like um, write it as if that person will be reading it. Um, so back to what I just said, don't send a generic request. We've all gotten those. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. And we're like, who the heck are you? Did I meet you? Do I know you? Um, so again, instead of just clicking on that connect button in search results, go to their profile and there will likely be a little drop down right arrow, which allows you to personalize the invitation. Now, like I mentioned before, these, this message box is not as large as the regular message one, so you'll have to be pretty quick and to the point about what you're asking for, um, but always personalize it. Never just use the generic, I want to connect with you on LinkedIn. Um, so be specific um, and don't, don't ask for a job. <laughs> Even if that's your ultimate goal, if you wanna work at their company, um, you wanna stroke their ego. I was looking through professionals who work at TripAdvisor and um, you, I saw that you are a Northeastern alum as well. I would love to learn more about how you like working at that company, what your career path has been since Northeastern. Um, it's, it looks like you have a lot of great experience, ego stroke, ego stroke. Um, 
And so it really is about um, customizing your message, being very clear to um, your potential connection about what you want from them. Um, and just being nice, that social media etiquette that we see on Twitter, that we see on um, Facebook, that we see on uh, Instagram, the liking, um, that culture of, of ego stroking. Um, and now, one, lastly, one question that I get all the time is, should I buy LinkedIn Premium? Their con LinkedIn is constantly bombarding us with those um, suggestions to our email, or try LinkedIn Premium free for a month. Um, I say don't bother, and, and here's why. Um, LinkedIn is, your LinkedIn network is only as strong as the people in it, and if they're real connections. So LinkedIn Premium is going to give you more contact information for people. It's going to let you send in mail to people versus a message or versus an invitation to connect. But um, when people are most successful is when they're leveraging their own network, such as facilitating introductions um, and not just really going out on a limb and, and finding those pure strangers to connect with. So I don't think it's worth it to get LinkedIn Premium. Um, if others can prove me wrong, I'm happy to hear about it. Um, but I think your own um, boots on the ground efforts to expand your network are going to be much stronger and worthwhile in the long run. Another thing hot off the presses that LinkedIn just uh, released yesterday is a brand new update to their messaging interface. So now all of these messages and invitations to connect that you're sending out um, are much easier. They're all categorized in one place um, and they're organized by the people you're talking to. So kind of like Gmail organizes a conversation into one, um, all sent, received and archived messages are also all in one place. So something to check out in your new pro in your profile if you have haven't seen that yet. It's a lot more user friendly. So I have been going on for the last 40 minutes or so. I would love to um, open it up to your questions. And uh, Emily, if you have folks questions for me, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Uh, I can speak on behalf of everyone here by saying, wow, Alexander, that was a ton of incredibly helpful and very detailed information. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. I also can confess as being, even though I am in the world <laughs> of, it, of being a total LinkedIn novice. Um, so I learned a few things, thank you. And if anyone awesome. else is feeling a little bit overwhelmed perhaps, I just want everyone to know that you're in good company. And if you're on our webinar today, it's probably because you are part of the bossed up mindset of trying to make a pivot or make a career change or just grow your power in a way that's manageable. So don't feel like you have to walk away with every single tool in the night. We will be um, including the links that Alexander shared with us and this recording. So thank you. I see tons of questions that are rolling in. And the first one that came up earlier, Alexander, was about those company pages. What about the employer side? Let's say you have your own organization or you're in a leadership position. Um, what what sort of advice do you have for how to set up a company page well? And does it cost anything? Yeah, so I'm not sure about the costs actually because I'm typically working with folks as individuals. Um, so uh, you you can find that information very easily. Um, I believe it's like linkedin.com slash companies and they have lots of information about setting up company pages. Um, I will say that it does cost money to post a job um, for companies to post jobs, which is why it's so great to instead find groups that are relevant to the types of people you're recruiting for because posting in groups is free. Um, so it definitely does cost money to post jobs. There's a job I think it's a job recruiter premium account that you can get that could be very worthwhile if you're doing the majority of your recruiting and hiring through LinkedIn. I'm not sure about setting up a company page specifically. This is great. So, oh my goodness, everybody, you all just bombarded our chat window here. I know, I'm seeing these. These are great questions. Let's talk a little bit more about that profile description, specifically the headline and then yes. the summary. Alexander, I just want to note someone in here asked about social media branding more broadly, and we are covering that not next week, but the following. And so check out the federal lineup of all the Fierce Fall webinars and know that we have one coming up in two weeks that'll cover that. So today we're going to speak someone. 
Okay, great. So um, for the headline, so like I was saying, your headline doesn't, it shouldn't, honestly, shouldn't be your most default, um, your default most recent company uh, title. Um, it, but it could be a lot of different things. So um, you need to decide what you really want it to say about you. And this is really, this came up a lot when I was working with private clients um, because you wanted to show a bit of your personality. Um, you might, you know, it's all of those most important things you want to get up there right at the top so people can't help but see them. So it could be an aspirational position. If you're still in school, it could be aspiring journalist and student at Brandeis University, for example. Um, if you are an expert on something, it should list one of those skills up there. If you are an executive, you should probably have that C-level executive title somewhere up there because, again, that's going to position you in that, um, in that light. Um, so mine, for example, is mission-driven marketer and engagement expert and then i can use a little you know you can use plus signs you can use slashes um, make it a little more visually appealing um, and then it says connecting the brandeis community for success so i branded myself apart from my current role in what i do by saying you know marketing is a big part of that's important to me in my career but then also i'm connecting with a lot of brandeis people on linkedin for work purposes so i wanted to add that piece in there too so you can have like a dichotomy in your headline as well but it needs to be um what you want it to be another client i was working with um C-level gentleman um, has a lot of um, experience with Salesforce, and so he was experimenting how to get his Salesforce experience into his headline. And he tried Salesforce Ninja, and he's like, eh, maybe that's a little much. Um, he ended up with Salesforce Innovator, which I think was really strong. Great, really good piece of advice. And um, how about that description below, where you have more space, but it's, you know, some people think that a formal bio there feels stilted. Should you write it in the first person or third person? Should it be a personal narrative? What do you think? Yeah, so I I've seen it work well a lot of different ways. Um, whatever you do, you want to be consistent throughout. So I'm like a grammar crazy person. And so if you are not using full sentences, don't use full sentences throughout. If you're using bullet points, use bullet points. If you're using I, stick with I. Um, it really should um, be relatively short. It shouldn't go on for paragraphs and paragraphs. Um, and there's also some formatting you can play around with. So unfortunately, um, LinkedIn doesn't support HTML or anything fun like that. Um, but you can use stars, you can use dashes, um, and, and to give additional um, highlight to skills or awards that you've received um, and make it look a lot of different ways. So I would recommend uh, if you're interested in a specific career field, um, you want to update your profile, look at what other people in your industry, in your job function are doing and see what looks really good on their profiles and copy it. Right. Obviously not copy the text, but copy the formatting, copy how they've um, approached their summary. Great. So I think we have time for two more quick questions and I just want to note that you have to tweet these out at us because we will continue to respond on Twitter. Yes. Um, so just as Twitter, it's AA underscore Stevens with a PH um, to get in touch with Alexandra and at Boston or, or just use the hashtag Fearsqual and we will find you. So continue <laughs> to your questions that way if we don't get to them right now. I want to go back to your interesting points about Stranger Danger on LinkedIn. Yes. And um, getting those randos sort of requests. I am guilty of accepting willy nilly because I am a little bit lazy and or busy in other areas of my yeah. life. And so we've got some folks on here that asked a really great question. Twofold. One, how important is it to get to that 500 plus threshold to yeah. seek a super connector? And two, does my LinkedIn network reflect on me? based on who I'm accepting a request for, in your opinion? Yeah, so um, both great questions. So I'll, I'm going to also go to my contact information slide. So if people do have questions, you know, feel free to tweet me um, or send me a customized message on LinkedIn. 
Um, but uh, that, the 500 plus connections. Okay, so I, I felt it deep down in my heart, I felt like a little jump for joy when I got to over 500, um, just because it doesn't show you that pure number anymore. And so for example, like Mark Zuckerberg has 500 plus connections and so do I. Um, they don't really distinguish between anything above 500, um, but it really is quality, not quantity. Um, not important to get to the 500 level. It's not a club. You don't get a pat on the back. Um, it really depends on who's in your network um, and are they appropriate to be in your network. So for example, um, you know, if we're thinking about those invitations to connect, um, if we're thinking about those requests for introductions, you could, if you don't know the people in your network, you could be getting requests from other people to introduce you to them or to vouch for them or to serve as a reference for them. Um, and that could put you in a really awkward position if you don't actually know them. So um, I think your network does reflect on you and other people, just like you're using their networks, they're using your network. Um, so think about it in that, in that sense. Would you feel comfortable introducing someone in your network that you don't know um, to someone you do? Right. And there's just, I mean, one of the biggest takeaways here for me is that there's just so much potential if you're willing to figure it out. Um, so thank oh, absolutely. You for walking us through that, it really it's lit a little fire under my butt to get my mom together on LinkedIn and use it for all it's worth. Um, yep. So I've got one final series of questions that have come in from quite a few bosses here, which is so indicative of what Boss Up does. We help women navigate transition. And so when you are trying to change careers, can you tell us a little bit more about what the aspirational profile might look like? And what your advice is for reflecting not necessarily the job you currently have, but the, the job you want and how to, yeah. deal, how to deal with your past in a way that's still honest, but, um, but sad. Yeah, I think that's that's a great question, and um, that's really where the headline and that summary are going to tie it all together for people, because your past experiences, just as your current title, doesn't dictate who you are as a professional, and it certainly might not dictate where you want to go in the future as a professional. So, um, great questions. Um, again, one of my private clients I worked with, um, in his past experience, he was in the military for, for 15 years before going into technology, and um, um, and it was showing up as his top education. And it was really confusing to me. He didn't reference it anywhere else. And, um, and yet it was a really big part of his experience, his professional experience. And so he ended up fusing that into his summary section, you know, to, to talk about how his past experience in the military um, helps him to uh, work better with groups, to be a better leader, and he really leverages those skills now. And so it was such a brief mention, but it's just like, ah, light bulb, that totally makes sense. Um, and so for folks who are asking questions about, should I leave off my past experiences if they're not relevant? Um, it's really, it's really, you're really going to have to decide that on your own. If it's, you know, a, a career from 30 years ago, I could, and it's not relevant to today, I think you could leave it off. But if it's, you know, in the last 10 to 15 years, and that's been the bulk of your professional experience, you got to keep it on to show that there have been, hasn't been huge gaps in your employment. Um, but, but address that in, in your summary um, and in your headline. That's a great point. And I think what it comes down to is that it depends, right? It really does depend. Yep. That particular question is so great. Um, my best advice on how to distill your best talents and most incredible spiel for your bio, for your blurb, for your headline is always to get someone you trust to mirror it back to you. So, yeah. you know, I highly advise working with someone like Alexandra who helps people do this all the time and helps you distill down to your greatest assets and how you can transfer that to the job that you really want. Having a marketing professional in your corner doesn't hurt. Um, so be sure to get in touch if you want to talk with her further. And then the other thing is a bestie can do the same, right? Like, obviously, we're not all marketing professionals, but we are very bad, in my opinion, as human beings, and maybe as women in particular, at seeing our strongest assets and our biggest strengths and how we can actually apply that to our desired next steps. 
So work with someone else on this, even if it means grabbing a glass of wine and talking it through and download some resources from bossedup.org to help you do so. The Life Tracker, which is all over our website, can help. And really, the Fierce Fall resources that have come out in last week's challenge and yesterday uh, in our second week's challenge, and that will keep coming out for the next eight weeks, um, can help you do that also. But it takes a squad, right? It takes a community to make it. It does. And that's yeah. a while. Absolutely. And it, and it takes time. And so, you know, Emily, you mentioned that women sometimes have trouble talking about themselves and zeroing in on those accomplishments. I've worked with male clients too. They have the same issues. I yeah. mean, it really is universal. And, you know, we, it's, it's not our tendency to want to talk about ourselves and brag about ourselves. Right. And so, you know, we really want to look at our, your presence on LinkedIn or on your resume or in an interview. Um, in terms of framing it of what can you do for your employer? What can you do for your clients? It's not about tooting your own horn necessarily, but it's about um, what strengths are you going to bring to the table that others will see value in? And so that's sometimes a little easier to, to swallow. Yeah, and it's not a time to be shy. It's time to be a boss, as we like to say around here. So thank you so much, Alexander. Again, it's always a pleasure to have you join. Likewise. Us. Thanks to everyone else for tuning in. Please keep in touch on Twitter. Share the Fierce Fall campaign with a boss to be that you know. Don't keep this from your besties because we all do better and we all do better. So thanks so much. I will talk to you all very soon. Take care. Thank you.